to react to the stories that have had us glued to our feeds all week. First up, the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. It's been a week of compelling and heart-wrenching testimony as the former police officer faces three separate murder and manslaughter charges for the death of George Floyd. On Friday, we heard from Minneapolis Police Lieutenant Richard Zimmerman, the department's longest-serving officer, who explained why everything Chauvin did that day was wrong. Pulling him down to the ground, face down, and putting your knee on a neck for that amount of uh, that amount of time is just um, uncalled for. Um, it, I saw no reason why the officers felt they were in danger if that's what they felt, um, and that's what they would have to feel to be able to use that kind of force. Joining me now is my dear friend, Angela Rye, host of On One with Angela Rye, Paolo Ramos, author of Finding Latinx, and Roro, Roland Martin, host of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I've got the hottest panel uh, in television, so thank you guys. Angela, I want to turn to you first on this because you're an attorney. Watching this trial, it seems like an open and shut case. I have to tell you, one of my favorite moments uh, was Donald Williams, the MMA fighter. Uh, I'm waiting for the control room to tell me if we have that sound, but he had an amazing uh, sound bite uh, this week when he was asked about something that he said to the police officers. Uh, I don't think we have it but he basically an attorney asked him uh, you said you would slap the you know what out of the police officers and he looked at the attorney and said yeah then looked over to Derek Chauvin and said I meant it a moment for me in the trial but Angela tell me what your take on this trial was well Tiffany I think first what is on trial isn't just Derek Chauvin it is whether or not police officers will ever have to um, pay the cost for taking the lives of black people in the Minneapolis Police Department, for example, 20% um, of the Minneapolis of Minneapolis residents are black, but 60% of the use of force force incidents are involving black folks. And so, what really is on trial is whether or not black lives truly matter, and whether or not white white police officers and perpetrators of these crimes will ever have to pay the cost for taking our lives. So we're watching that with that heaviness. Um, the testimony against Derek Chauvin this week has certainly been compelling, whether we're talking about the longest serving police detective in the department saying that not only was it a violation of policy, but it was totally unnecessary. Um, that nine minutes and 29 seconds that we watched and we were mistakenly for so long throughout the whole summer saying eight minutes and 46 seconds, watching the, the testimony of the girlfriend, of his girlfriend, where all of a sudden George Floyd and his drug use is on trial. This isn't about whether or not he was high or not. It is not about a counterfeit $20 bill or not. It is about whether or not the use of force was in alignment with whatever the alleged action was that George Floyd took. So yeah, we'll ex ex exactly. Angela, I think you make a good point. And Roland, let me ask you, because Look, a lot of people are saying on Twitter and social media, you know, whiteness is on trial here. White supremacy is on trial. And I have to say, slow your roll, because that's a longer trial that would take years. And I would like to be a witness in that trial myself. You've been covering this on Roland Martin Unfiltered. What do you think this trial says to the country about the larger conversation around law enforcement, systemic white supremacy that exists within law enforcement, and its engagement with black communities all over this country? Well, what folks watching this will understand the lack of protocol and how folks broke various rules. It was powerful to have the prosecution in the first week to put on two cops to, in essence, contradict the actions of Derek Chauvin. Uh, when you look at many of these previous cases, you typically do not see that. You don't see a homicide officer, a member of the blue, sitting on the stand essentially saying to another one, you screwed up royally. And so that was critically important. And I think what people are seeing, and look, extremely emotional for a lot of black people, it has been very hard to listen to this testimony, to those witnesses, the crying on the stand. But people have to see what we've always known. And to have this trial televised is important because they are listening to uh, people walk through step by step and see uh, the actions and see how the other officers stood around and no one intervened. To hear the EMT say uh, they did not uh, choose to uh, even do chest compressions. You see the callous nature and behavior of the police. And I would hope white Americans 
uh, Latino Americans, uh, individual Asian Americans, individuals who have not had to be impacted the way black folks have, are watching this saying, hey, there is something here to what African Americans have been saying. Now let's have real changes when it comes to police in this country. Yeah, I think you raise a good point, uh, Roland. And I want to bring in Paula in here because I do think when we have these conversations around police brutality, certainly the black communities are overly impacted, punctuated by it. And it's, I think, often gut-wrenching for us because, as Angela says, we built this country for free. But, Paula, I do want to point out that there are areas like New York, for example, where the Latino community are certainly victims of police brutality, just like many folks in the black community. What was your take on this trial, Paula? I mean, what I kept thinking about was Ms. Mr. McMillan's words, I feel helpless, because I think that moment captured exactly what many, what every single black and brown person in this country was feeling, which is there was this sense of him surrendering to this idea that in this country and still within this white supremacist system, the death of George Floyd was inevitable because from the very beginning, he was not treated as a human being. He was never seen as a human being. That's something that Latinos and immigrants can relate to every single day. From the very beginning, he was treated as a criminal. I think the other thing that really stood out for me was the way that his girlfriend, you know, that Ms. Ross had to push back against those very stereotypes that they tried to use time and time again to criminalize him, to have us view him still as this angry black man, as a drug addict, and she simply painted the picture of an ordinary black man with a lot of pain. And once again, every single day, Latinos in the border, immigrants in the border are being criminalized. And in the image that I saw was a picture of someone that was not a criminal and someone that instead was a victim of a system that is criminal. And that, I think, is something that as Latinos and as immigrants, we, we, we try and, and, and talk about every single day. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the system, this puts on display the system in America that we've uh, endured for incredibly long. And I just want to say, again, Donald Williams spoke to my spirit when he looked that man in the eye and said, yes, I said it, and yes, I meant it. So somebody I'd like to look in the eye and say some things and say, yes, I said it and meant it. Uh, is Matt Getz. The uh, new developments in the Justice Department investigation of this notorious Trump lackey, a Republican congressman from Florida, who is being investigated for possibly violating sex trafficking laws. On Friday, his longtime aide and communications director, Luke Ball, resigned out of principle, he says, according to a person familiar with the matter. The New York Times reports that the DOJ investigation centers on whether Getz had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old and paid for her to travel with him. Investigators are also looking into allegations that Getz and an associate paid women for sex, according to the Times, which reviewed text and receipts from the encounters. I'm a fan of receipts. Getz has not been charged with anything. He has denied all the allegations and claims that they are the work of an extortion plot against him. Uh, Angela, one thing that struck me about this story is when he was on air, he described this 17-year-old as a woman. He said this 17-year-old woman. And I want you to take a listen to Tucker Carlson uh, when I think Matt Getz was trying to get him roped up and involved in this uh, to the clip that he, uh, he, he, he had on Fox News. Take a listen. Actually, you and I went to dinner uh, about two years ago. Your wife was there, and I brought a friend of mine. You'll remember her. And she was actually threatened by the FBI, told that if she wouldn't cop to the fact that somehow I was involved in some pay-for-play scheme, uh, that she could face trouble. I don't remember the, the woman you're speaking of or the context at all, honestly. I mean, if I don't know this dude was a, a person, that was Tucker Carlson in that moment. Angela, what's your take on this entire fiasco? Well, it's um, kind of poetic justice, Tiff. You have this situation where um, here we are the day before Resurrection Sunday, and Tucker Carlson is out here denying <laughs> Matt Getz three times like Simon Peter did Jesus. But I digress. <laughs> um, you know, I think what is fascinating to me is so often, you know, the elders will tell us when you point a finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. That is what I see when I think about Matt Getz. Matt Getz was one of the most excruciating um, voices on the right during Andrew Gillum's um, gubernatorial run in Florida. He said yep. something about calling Andrew Gillum, Andrew Killam, talking about Tallahassee having the highest murder rate, homicide rate in Florida, ridiculous, nonsensical things that he regularly says. 
targeting Andrew, you know, in a very difficult time, using language that I wouldn't use against my worst enemy. And yet, alas, here he is, white boy R. Kelly, um, probably having done a lot more than what we know and figuring out some crazy twisted way to tie all of this up into an extortion plot from the FBI. And all I can say to you is, um, you got three fingers pointing back at you, Matt. And, you know, you really better hope that you find a good lawyer and you probably should have listened to your comms director who would have advised you to stay your behind off of Tucker Carlson's program because he only put himself in, in, himself in more harm's way. Either he is um, a rich, nasty hoe or he is a rich, nasty, predatory hoe. And that's the truth on this Saturday morning. Uh, okay, I hear you, Angela, and I'm yeah. rolling up with a call to you on that because Angela makes a good point. I mean, Matt Getz is a problem. But the bigger thing for me is she brought up R. Kelly. I mean, surviving R. Kelly was trending. Surviving the GOP should be trending. We have survived this 400-year nightmare by a lot of the people who occupied that party. And now that we're here with Matt Getz, what kind of weird, creepy, old white guy club are they a part of? You remember they defended Roy Moore, the accused pedophile in Alabama. They defended, uh, I think his name was uh, Rob Portman, the guy who was accused of beating his ex-wife. Will the Republican Party stand by Matt Getz? And if they do, what implication will this have on the party as a whole? Uncle Roro, break it down for us. Well, since I wore my Easter suit for Aaron Haynes, uh, who's watching, <laughs> um, uh, we, we, and my, my wife is an ordained minister. She got papers. I'm bootleg. Uh, let's just go to church. Um, where you at, Robert Jeffress? Where you at, Ralph Reed? Where are you, Franklin Graham? Mm. Where are you, Paula White? Where are all of you white conservative evangelicals who love talking about morality and principles and family and values? How are you saying nothing? Y'all were all running your mouths when Congressman John Conyers, the late congressman, was accused of uh, sexual harassment. You were running your mouths when uh, Serena Al Franken was accused of the same thing, but now all of a sudden you're quiet. Now CNN is reporting that Matt Gates was showing nude photos and videos of women he allegedly slept with to other House members. Where are you? See, this shows the hypocrisy of these white conservative evangelicals and also the black conservative evangelicals who stand with them. This shows how foul and fake they are. If, if Keenan Ivory Wayans and Jada Pinkett Smith did a sequel to A Low Down Dirty Shame, it will be a documentary on today's Republican Party. They say nothing with one of their members. And Fox News for three days hadn't said a word until Brett Baer reported on it last night. Oh, but you had Matt Gates on nearly, nearly 20 times in the month of March. This shows you how fake and how much of a joke they are when it comes to family values. You are not the party of family values. You are not the party of the working class. You are silent and quiet, and that's why I will never again, they, can say, they can't say anything about any future Democrat or anybody else because of their shameful behavior. They're fake Christians. Well, uh, Roro, I just want to let you know it's Saturday, not Sunday, but you took us to church anyway. So thank you uh, for that. And you made some really good points. Um, Paula, I wanted to get you to weigh in here, but we're running out of time. And I really want to make the hard turn here to talk about Lil Nas X. I got these two church folks on with me. So I'm curious everyone's <laughs> opinion. Everyone from Fox News to Republican governors have expressed outrage about Lil Nas X's new video uh, from Montero. But his Twitter clapbacks have almost been as epic as the video himself. Like my personal favorite quote, uh, I spent the entire my entire teenage years hating myself because of the ish. You all know what I'm talking about. Y'all preach what happened to me because I was gay. So I hope you are mad. Stay mad. Feel the same anger you teach us to have towards ourselves. I have to say the Lil Nas X video um, certainly achieved what he wanted. It caused a whole lot of conversation. Uh, but Paolo, what do you make of this? Because some people are saying, oh, this is satanic. It's devil worship. Um, but, you know, in some ways, it's him expressing himself as an artist. So what's your take? Yeah, I'd, I'd just start by saying that I think the, the outrage is completely misplaced, right? It's not that he is somehow failing Christianity or the church. It's that for decades, for centuries, Christianity has failed queer people. I mean, how many times, and I include myself, have, have I heard, have we heard that I will go to hell because I love the way that I love? 
right? right? How many times has he heard that time and time again? And so that is simply him completely reclaiming that narrative. That's one part. And then the second thing is we should always be celebrating any time that someone can unapologetically be whomever they want, right? There's not enough representation of Black queer youth on any TV screens, on any cell, cell phones, on music. And so th this literally saves lives, right? Coming out of the closet, loving in silence, loving inside of closets, it can cost lives. And so I, I am I am nothing but but happy. And I think we should let him do whatever the hell he wants. That is the Gen Z generation that is unstoppable. And to create art for no one other than yourself is something that we should always celebrate. Bro, I want to ask you because, oh, look, uh, some of these people know these lyrics better than I do. When Cardi B came out with WAP, they knew the song better than I did. They knew the video better than I did. So all these conservatives who are up in arms about this, why do they seem to focus on this issue more than actual policy that they should be focused on? You had South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem focused on this. And it's like, girlfriend, you run a state, run rampant with COVID right now. Why is this your focus? What do you have to say about it? because the Republican Party is focused on the cultural touch points, and they use that to drive their people out to the polls. The strongest base of the Republican Party are white conservative evangelicals. These are the very issues uh, that get them ramped up. Now, let me be real clear. I don't, I don't even joke around with Satan and the devil, uh, and so you, you, can, you, you can keep them shoes. Uh, plus, I ain't never spending that much money for a damn pair of tennis shoes. Uh, but, uh, the, but the bottom line here is this here. Uh, this is all about ramping up their base. That's what it boils down to. For him, it's about marketing. It's about branding. And so those things, those two things clash. And that's all you really have going on here. And so they're going to keep talking about it. That's what they do because they can't talk about policy. They don't want to talk about policy. They don't want to discuss the poor or anything along those lines. That's why. All right. This was the best panel we had all day. Uh, Angela, you'll have to come back. We're so out of time. But thank you, Angela, Paula Ramos, and Rolla Martin. We'll have to have this exact panel back again a thousand times. I love all your input, and thank you so much.